No budget decision was taken without being informed by what we call gender budget and that gender gender based analysis plus. Now we firmly believe that this must not be a one time event. It must be how all future budgets are made. Finance Minister Bill Morneau earlier today, not the first person to make a budget based on gender analysis, but he's hoping to be the last finance minister not to. Supporting women was a huge theme in this budget, and there was a lot more to it than just gender. For all of that, we have at issue in the House with me here in Ottawa, Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj, all here with me on Parliament Hill. Okay, I had a little preview in terms of what these guys would say earlier this afternoon. They're not jumping for joy over the budget. What the big takeaway, Sean? tell uh, pre-election document uh, not much of a plan in there hard to find the vision uh, lots you're right of women's stuff a colleague of mine in the French version counted 700 instances of women in the plural mm -hmm. that's a lot um, but I think a lot of, uh, of women will look at this and say but where's the beef because you for all of these references uh, and a lot of these things are good initiatives, the, the beef would be a more affordable child care program yes. if you want to get women Which in is the what, workforce. Yeah. And it's not really there. And you signaled that even last week, saying that was the key to showing that you meant it, really. Well, for millennials who are now starting or having families, it's obviously the biggest budget item plus affordable housing. So combine the two and all this language about analysis is bound to fly right past a lot of people. Is this not, though, Andrew, um, let, let's say we're, we can look at it and pull a story thread out, and the story thread is growth through all different segments of the population. Is that a possibility, that the story they were trying to tell? Uh, that they're trying to tell, yes. And, <laughs> and, and there's some truth in it. Obviously, if you're not making maximum use of every section of your population, including in this case particularly women, uh, you, then you're going to be you know, having less than optimal growth. That's true. But there's a lot of other things that go into growth, most of which was just basically ignored in this budget. Uh, so the equality part, they were very concerned about the growth part less. And we're facing really quite um, severe challenges right now, uh, both short term with the uh, tax reform bill in the United States and the sudden change in the competitive climate that that's right, and that's a real thing, and long term with the demographic challenge of the aging of the population and the, the implication of being we've got to make sustained long term increases in productivity. And there's just very little address to that. It's not really a budget per se uh, at all, really. It's more of a manifesto. It's more of a statement of liberal beliefs. Every liberal belief that they've ever had or hope people have, think, think they have. And yeah, with the election very much in mind. Or taken from the NDP, as or it were. Or stolen from the NDP <laughs> and now made into liberal policies. Uh, Althea, what was your sort of takeaway in, in terms of how they were framing it and whether it, there's something there? Yeah, it's a political document. It's a political document where Minister Morneau highlights that liberals are more concerned about the NDP than anything else, uh, Donald Trump included, or NAFTA. Um, and so he's stealing some of the NDP's best ideas, Pharmacare, practically really the only costed NDP idea, um, and also stealing stuff from their 2015 platform, the NDP, on pay equity legislation, yeah. um, even on making status of women um, or giving it a, a larger mandate. In this case, they're making it a permanent department. Those are two promises from the NDP in 2015. Um, so it's it's interesting that that is where they are going, but they really have opened themselves up on the right. I mean, there is no tax cut. There is no talk of tax cuts. Um, and uh, often, you know, when you hear it, um, those on the left say they want to uh, find new ways to uh, increase spending by finding revenues. They look at tax loopholes mm -hmm. and tax evasion. The Liberals are doing that. They are not going after line by line waste. But they, 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 is there a right that they could go after anyway? I mean, are they wildly attracting from the right typically? Was there some flank that they could go after? No, but they leave themselves open uh, to future events. And I don't mean future events a decade from now. You take this budget and you read it the way it's framed, and it's a long book. It's not a short budget. And you would think that uh, this event that the government has talked to us about, the American election, right. the Trumping, Never it's happened. absent. It's, yeah. it's as if it is non-existent in the government's thinking that it changed nothing. Uh, 
I, I suspect it changed the agenda here, but you find no evidence of that, no evidence of the challenges that Andrew was talking about or, or of, of the government looking to address them. They're mentioned in passing as in we're going to have a long winter. Certainly political job one for the Liberals is always to, to nail down the NDP. Sure. They've been successful also in the recent past, the Gretchen and Martin years, with taking away that center-right vote by going after the deficit. Mm -hmm. They sort of feel like, I imagine, that they don't need to do that right now because the deficit right now is quiescent. Mm -hmm. The Liberals are running small deficits for the same reason that the Harper Conservatives ran small surpluses purely for political symbolism. It, you know, $10 billion either way really doesn't matter. But, and the big but is, uh, we're 10 years into a recovery. Uh, all these numbers are predicated on the fact that we're never going to have another recession again, or at least in the next uh, couple of, of years. Yeah. And that's not at all clear. We, we've already seen rumblings in the interest rates of, of them starting to climb. So we're already into a slightly different world than we've known for the last few years. And again, there's not much sign of recognition of that. Here. So, the, the, and that gives us a, a jumping off point for the deficit, because that is no longer a dirty word, and it's certainly not something that they seem interested in tackling at any point. No, and in fact, some of the numbers around that math, I mean, Andrew kind of pointed to it, they are creative numbers. I mean, they have uh, pushed off infrastructure spending in future years. They've miraculously booked $354 million from uh, tax evaders. They have miraculously found $19 billion. Interestingly enough, there is $21 billion of savings. The, the numbers seem to interestingly line up. They don't actually tell us what they're cutting. Um, so it's uh, creative of math, maybe? I'm not sure. Um, but uh, no, deficits are, people seemed okay with deficits, yes. but you have to wonder, you know, Paul Martin that they trotted out during the 2015 campaign to say, don't worry, we're going to be like the old right of center liberals. I mean, what would he think about this? Because they have given that up completely. I, I tell them, I guess, Andrew, uh, you know, I may be old school. I came here <laughs> in the 80s and I have never heard the finance minister, so that would be Mulroney onward. Yeah that didn't care about balancing the books, at least paid lip service to caring, which isn't well, even the case. Yeah. I'm guessing the premise that guides a lot of this budget is the premise that the chickens that could come home to roost will do so after the next election in a year and a half and not before that. And that seems a, dangerous to play that, though. And there's a certain amount of indirection involved. Uh, so on the one hand, they're running the deficits, we're rejecting austerity. I think they're maybe hoping their friends on the left don't notice that spending actually is supposed to level off now for the next several years. And here's a little fun fact for you. Average spending under the Harper years as a percentage of GDP, 13.7%. Average spending over the next five years under the we don't like austerity liberals, 13.8%. So there's your big difference in, in the spending. So how do they use this then to sort of secure their narrative for the future? If this was about putting the squeeze on the NDP, not worrying about the Conservatives, I guess, how do they push that forward, that story? What, what are we going to see over the next... Do you see how many groups have come forward to say how great this budget yes. was? I mean, so they've done what they need to do. University, well, uh, politically, they probably rightly feel that they have. Yes. Whether that's what you expect from a government rather than an opposition party campaigning for victory is a different story. It's classic liberal clientelism. They've got a, they're sowing all these different groups across the country. They're creating it's a coalition. new ones. It's well, it's a coalition of the funded, you know, <laughs> the, of all these groups <laughs> who will take the money and then amplify the liberal message. They're nonpartisan, they're independent, but they're kind of on the same page. And they're happy. And they're, and they're happy. Well, it, it's a budget that speaks to their ambition, right? They like to spend. They like to pick winners and losers. Yes. This is a, a budget where the heavy hand of government is involved. And there will be lots of people on the right who are very uncomfortable with that. But the government is saying, well, we're not your government, so that's fine with us. Only about a minute left. Does it save Bill Morneau? I mean, I, I don't know if he was out of trouble anyway if we had moved past that. But does this secure that he gets to do a fourth budget and maybe after re-election yet another one? I'm assuming he gets to do a fourth budget. Today is the day when I decided that he was never going to fit the mold of the uh, fiscal anchor uh, of the government and the cabinet. And that's okay? The voters will decide that. Yeah, he's I perhaps saved his job by handing over the writing of the budget to the status of women department. I mean, this is not a conventional <laughs> finance minister's budget. <laughs> no. Uh, so he himself is no longer particularly an asset to the government, but maybe they've decided he's not so, so much of a, of a uh, whatever, the liability uh, that they can leave him in place. 30 seconds. Yeah, I don't know that he is not the finance minister they wanted. I think he had a rocky start because he was a political neophyte and he felt personally attacked. And I think he sort of learned his lessons and how to deal with the media. And today you saw a much more polished version of Bill Morneau. I think he's sticking around. But in a storm, 
I'm not so sure. Everything's Nick different. Justin Trudeau will take the questions. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> all right. We're just going to stay here and talk for another 20 minutes. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Good news for all of you who love politics as much as we do. At Issue is also a podcast. You can get extra content and, of course, the main panel in podcast form every week. iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national.